Well, here we go. Thank you for joining me today. And we're going to go through the second of the hard dibbing articles that appeared in the People newspaper in September 1961. Uh, this one's from the 10th of September. Uh, People newspapers on a Sunday, of course, only on a Sunday. So the previous one was on the 3rd of September. The next one on the 17th and the, so on and so forth. That's the way dates work. Seven days in a week and all. Mm-hmm. So we're going to I'm gonna do a read-through of this hard dibbing article. Let me uh, share my screen with you all. Share screen. And the article, I may have to change where my position is on the screen while I read this. The article is called My Death Warrant. And on top it says... Um, Satan does not give up his slaves without a deadly struggle. As Hod Dibbon found when he tried to renounce his life of evil. It came as I knelt in church to pray. So this was a double page spread. This isn't hidden in the back pages. This was page two. Apparently... In a you know the Sunday the bigger edition of a newspaper, Hod Dibbin was um, uh, page two and page three. Was a page three girl. Yum 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 yum. There's <laughs> oh my god, it's so it's all bombast, but it's brilliant. Hod Dibbin, a quiet man from a respectable, God fearing family, reveled for years in the vile orgies of black magic, until the night he attended the terrible ceremony of the girl and the goat. From that moment, he resolved to give up his life of evil. But it is not easy for a slave of Satan to escape his bondage. Threats of vengeance and death hounded him. Read the story of his escape from the devil and be warned by Hod Dibbin. <laughs> I look forward. I mean, I, I did have a bit of fun on the first one, and I do expect to expand this a little bit. Hod Dibbin so interesting. And quite amusing. So just before I start with this wonderful, uh, I, I want to explain a little bit for those who haven't heard what happened in the first part. Hard Divin um, is on the Isle uh, in the town of Twat uh, in the Orkney Isles and got approached by a black magic woman after finding an egg nest with eggs in, with Nazi swastikas painted. I think they might be painted in blood, if I remember. <laughs> and a load of strange happenings. And then he joined in the orgies um, of these uh, of this black magic circle. And then he was in. And we continue from there. In the comforting sanctuary of my village church, I knelt in my pew to pray. And as my eyes were about to close in devotion, they lighted on a a scrap of paper on the tile floor beside me. On it was a crude drawing of an inverted cross and the severed head of a cockerel. One glance was sufficient to tell me it was my death warrant. (laughs) I stole a swift glance around the silent church to see who might have put the paper there. But there was nobody save the regular members of the congregation kneeling in prayer. With my heart pounding in fear, I quickly finished my prayers, hurried from the church and raced home. There I spread out the piece of paper and examined it closely. Beneath the drawing were the words, You cannot hide. Your life is in Satan's hands. It confirmed my dread. The brotherhood of Satan had caught up with me and intended to take my life. For two years, I had been an elder in the brotherhood of the evil black magic circle, which I had joined when I was an RAF officer in the Orkneys. (laughs) Sorry, I might giggle in this. I took vows which bound me to the service of Satan for the rest of my life. I promised to do evil instead of good, to sneer at purity, to worship obscenity. And I was true to those vows. Faithful, I took part in the brotherhood of every kind of debauchery and filth. And I am ashamed now to admit that I did all of this with intense pleasure and exhilaration. Until one night, one terrible night, the horror of which I can never erase from my memory. 
that was when the brother had decided to honour a special date in the devil's calendar by offering a human sacrifice. I tremble to this day as I recall the sight of the young girl, her slim, naked body silhouetted against the moonlit sky on an Orkney hillside. Bloodshed. A few yards from her was a fully grown ram, its eyes blazing, its body tensed and straining at the tethering rope which was tied around its gleaming horns. The ghostly hooded spectators on the hillside waited in excitement until the hour of climax. Then, when the moon had reached its height, a tall figure in a white robe stepped forward and released a maddening ram with a quick knife slash of the rope. There was a scream. Ah! <laughs> then deadly silence, and the girl's blood flowed into the heather. She did not die. But it was indeed a human sacrifice, for I knew that she would always bear the scars on her mind and the body of the terrible ravaging encounter on the hillside. Her parents was among the hooded spectators of the ghastly ritual. Up to that moment, there had been few members of the Brotherhood more enthusiastic than I and I really believed that the odd circumstances which had drawn me, a member of the respectable, wealthy, highly religious family, into the cult were the workings of some supernatural force. But this sickening spectacle jerked me back into my senses at last. I resolved to have no more to do with black magic. I renounced my satanic vows and promises. I would turn my back on evil. A start life afresh. I made that decision in full knowledge of the dreadful threat and the warnings that Brotherhood constantly sounded against traitors. But I knew I was leaving the Orkneys and returning to England very soon, and I was confident I would be safe from reprisal there. I underestimated the long arm of satanic vengeance. Only two days after I left the Orkneys, as I was driving my uh, to my home near Southampton, I pulled up at the traffic lights in Basingstoke, and suddenly I heard a rustle of, the pa of paper at my side. I turned my head in time to see a piece of paper fall through the open car window onto the passenger seat. Sign number two. I pulled into the curb and grasped the paper. Seven words were scrawled on it in blood, which was still wet. Your life is in our hands. Beware. A joke, or a sinister message delivered by an agent of the Black Circle, which I had deserted. After a moment's pause, I threw the note away contemptuously, certain that no harm could befall me. For a whole year there was silence. I settled down in my lovely home, my lovely old home, and began to make a name for myself as a connoisseur of arts and antiques. I did my best to forget Satan and his evil and conducted my life with the utmost Christian purpose. In an endeavour to atone for my sinful past, I read the Bible each morning, as I had been taught to do as a child, and each Sunday I attended divine service. The horrible message which I found on my pew was the last thing I expected, but there was no mistake in its meaning. I did not have long to wait for the next sign of vengeance, uh, the, of the vengeance forces that were closing in on me. It came in the form of a small square parcel, parcel, tied with white tape, that arrived with my mail in the next morning at uh, the next morning at my antiques business in Southampton. No clue. Inside, wrapped in a tuft of cotton wool, was an antique silver ring bearing a skull and crossbones. There was no covering letter enclosed, no clue to who sent it. I was puzzled, but perhaps, I thought, the sender would ring up about it later. Then, suddenly, the feeling came over me that I had seen the ring somewhere before. I picked it up and examined it closely with an eyeglass. Inside the ring, just discernible, were some initials and the name Dibbin. Then I remembered, 
at my father's house was a picture of my great-grandfather. And a skull and crossbones ring could be clearly seen on his finger. I hurried to show my father the ring. He was astonished and visibly shaken at the sight of it. Where did this come from? It can't be the same. He gasped. With trembling lips, he told me that the ring had been treasured possession of my great-grandfather and had been buried with him on his death. The hallmark and the name inside the ring convinced my father it was the same one. But how can this be? He stammered. Oh, I don't understand. I tried to allay his fears, but saying it must all be a huge coincidence. By saying it must all be a huge coincidence. But in my heart, I was convinced it was the same ring that was that it was a supernatural force of black magic at work. And I knew it was meant to be yet another warning to me of my imminent death. On my way home, I called into the pensioners' arms in South Af uh, Southampton for a drink to settle my nerves. As I stood at the bar, I became aware of a stranger eyeing me intently. When he saw I had noticed him, he finished his drink quickly and left. I took no further notice and quietly continued my drink, leaving about ten minutes later. By now it was dark. As I crossed the road outside the public house, a large black saloon car came hurtling round the corner, straight towards me. I just managed to jump clear. The car sped by. I caught a momentary glimpse of the driver's face. It was a stranger who had been watching me at the bar. Satan's servant had failed this time. I said a silent prayer of thankfulness, but knew that it would not be the last attempt on my life, and I fell into a panic of anxiety. I began to suspect that at the least sound. I jumped. I jumped when the postman knocked at the door. I didn't even dare cross the street without taking elaborate precautions. <laughs> At night, I bolted all the doors and windows and kept a truncheon under my pillow. You sure that was a truncheon, Arthur? <laughs> Finally, I became so frightened <laughs> that I decided to take the cow's way out and rejoin the Brotherhood of Evil to save my skin. It was a terrible decision. <laughs> It was a terrible decision, taken at the height of my efforts to atone for my past wrongdoings and accept a Christian way of life, a caller. But I felt a fatalistic conviction that once one embraced the cult of evil by dabbling in black magic, one was in the clutches of Satan forever. I set out to discover if there was an active black magic coven near my home. I soon found one at Ringwood, in the heart of New Forest. I went down there one day and lunched at a restaurant in the town. I tipped the waitress generously and mentioned casually that I had heard of some unusual ceremonies in the forest. She gave me the name of a person who might have some information. He turned out to be an aged jobbing gardener who lived at, in a cottage on the edge of the forest. At first, he would say little, but after ten shilling note had passed hands, he told me about the clearing in the woods from which singing and dancing could be heard at night when the moon was full. I returned home, determined to pay a visit to the spot at the next full moon. That night, the telephone rang at home. A voice said, Stay, Brother Hod, and prepare to make peace with the master. I asked who was calling, and the line went dead. Mm. Five minutes later, there was a knock at the door. Standing there was a man in clergy's clothes, a black trilby hat, clerical collar, a black raincoat. My fears were allayed by his kindly voice. I decided it was time I made your acquaintance, Mr. Dibbin, he said. My name is Mizran. Stand. He held out his hand and I shook it warmly. 
So my visitor was merely one of the local clergy. I was glad to see him. He had a cheery manner and he stayed chatting for some minutes before taking his leave. As I saw him to the door, I remembered I had not asked which church he was from. He answered, I am sent by the master hot. He gave a nod of his head, replaced his black hat and was gone. I was stunned. For several seconds, I leaned weakly against the doorpost. Then, trembling, I returned to my chair in the sitting room for another shock. In the chair lay yet another note. It read simply, You will return. The note was written on the same kind of Charles exercise book paper as the other messages I had received. This time, however, there was no threat. Obviously, it was confidently, confidently expected I would return to the fold. On the night of the next full moon, I drove to Ringwood and I waited until darkness before making my way on foot into the forest. I looked around but could see or hear nothing of a black magic gathering. After a few minutes stumbling through the darkness of the undergrowth, I decided to turn back. Suddenly I was aware of movements around me and the flashing of torches. By the flickering lights, I could see that I was surrounded by figures in the familiar Ku Klux Klan hoods and cloaks. Not a word was spoken. I said in a voice hardly more than a squeak, I'm odd. I've come back. There was not a word in reply. The figures came towards me, their torches waving, wavering and flickering against the rustling leaves. Weird shadows were cast, and I became afraid. My voice rose to a shriek. Say something, can ya? The figures in the swishing cloaks continued to advance. Blinded by the lights from the torches, I put my hands to my eyes, and I rushed madly away from them. Ah! I brushed against a lowly bow of the tree, grazing my face. I fell headlong against a strand of barbed wire, tearing my trousers and cutting my leg. I plunged through the blackness, and gradually my pursuing tormentors were left behind. Thankfully, I arrived safely on the main road and quickly drove my car to my home, to my wife. Who was still who still knew nothing of my guilty black magic secrets? I explained my ragged appearance by saying I had a brush with a couple of drunks. Ooh, a star. After my adventure in the forest, the threats of the brotherhood grew more vicious. The notes with their grotesque drawings were followed by um persecution by telephone. Sometimes the phone rang a dozen times in the, in the night. Each time the voice would say, We'll get to then, or You haven't much longer to leave. The calls were obviously from uneducated louts who had been hired to do dirty work of their leaders. At least the tactics were reduced to human level that I could understand. I began to hope that any further threats or attempts on my life would take the form of a beating up. I was tall, well-built and strong. As a youth, I had quite a reputation as an athlete. Even though I was well into my forties, I felt more than a match for anybody who attacked me with two fists. But the insidious mental and spiritual persecution continued, and the threats came uncannily true. One day, I received a phone call from a man with a cultured voice who reminded me of the day years before when a hideous future was forecast for me if I renounced the magic black magic circle. I confess. Among the events predicted was the sudden death of my father and my virtual exclusion from his will. Both those things happened. My father and I had never been close friends, mainly because I did not agree with the severe principles he adopted as a member of the Plymouth Brethren. He considered me much too worldly for his highly religious household. Nevertheless, as the elder son, I was his heir, and I had no doubt that I would become rich man under his will until one day in 1950. He called me into his home and told me, 
He called me into his home and told me he had received a mysterious phone call, mentioned that skull and bones, uh, skull and crossbones ring. The caller said that I was to be punished for my wanton behaviour and that the similar fate was in store for other members of the family unless they openly rejected me. I had no alternative but to confess to my father or about the evil connections with black magic cult. I tried to explain that I'd been a victim of circumstances which drew me almost unwillingly into the circle, but he was terribly upset and would not listen. Cut in the will. The sinister phone call and my confessions made him very ill and convinced him that he was about to die. In his strange state of mind, he decided that the best way to make his peace with his maker was to make me pay for my past sins. There and then, he made a codicil to his will, which had the effect of cutting me off. And with startling suddenness, after that move, he was stricken with a heart attack and died at the age of 69. Apart from bouts of asthma, my father was strong and healthy, with many years of life apparently ahead of him. The second phase of the black magic of the black magic warning quickly came true when my father's will was read out, showing that he had left more than a hundred and fifty thousand pounds. It was revealed that although I, though I was to share the estate with my brother, certain conditions were made in my case that meant I would receive next to nothing. My father had stood guarantor for me when I borrowed large sums of money to develop my antique business. His will made no provision for the continuance of that guarantee. That meant I immediately had to pay back all the loans, which swallowed up my share of the will after death duties. For a long time afterwards, I faced financial ruin, before my affairs were finally put in order. Yet, strangely, I do not blame my father. I am convinced that his altering of the, my, his will that his altering of his will was following the mysterious phone call was the work of the devil. Divorce. The manner of my father's death and my suffering under the will were exactly what had been forecast by Cicera, the high priestess of Black Magic Circle in Scotland, many years before. Everything she foretold came to pass, including the breakup of my marriage, which had lasted 23 years. When my wife sued me for divorce, a situation of my own making, it was further proof of the extraordinary influence that was being exerted by unseen powers. Further terrible consequences of my, of my betraying my master Satan and withdrawing from black magic were yet to come. There was a tragic car crash in Italy which killed one of my best friends, an event which I knew would happen but was powerless to prevent. That's it. That's it. And as you saw halfway through, we skipped through it. It says, Next week, Hod's guest sleeps in a haunted room and is horribly mutilated. Hod utters a black magic curse and a man dies. People newspaper, everybody. So what were the adverts? I like the adverts last time. There's sometimes there's some pictures. So here you go. There's Hod o o holding this <laughs> skull and crossbones ring that apparently his grandfather was um, uh, buried with. Uh, apparently that's what, what what happened. Yeah. Small wonder that Dibbin was terrified by the mysterious arrival of the skull and crossbones ring. It had been buried on his great grandfather's finger. Now, what nonsense. What nonsense. What nonsense. Silly, silly nonsense. Oh, look, it's an advert for Coronation. Coronation Street looks better on a Murphy Astra. <laughs> you can't see Coronation Street, which is a British show. You can't see it on this television because the newsprint's so bad. You just got to believe what they're saying there. There's another versigram. The 13 letters of four consecutive words in the verse. Very interesting to put it on this page. 13, this, 13, that, just saying. Uh, your chance to make a better living of normal things that came up. So uh, sneezing and cold, Beecham's powder, Beecham, who would uh, soon uh, be merged with uh, Glaxo. 
uh, well, actually, Smith Klein and then with Glaxo eventually. Golden Virginia tobacco gives you more tobacco value. Yeah, I used to smoke that stuff. Ugh. Right, and all that new Sandrian. What's that about? Floor covering. Oh, what a wonderful, some lino. Excellent. I always like to see what is actually going on on these pages, but there you go. Death warrant. Um, I'm going to come out of the screen share here. Stop share here. Right. I hope you enjoyed that. That was the second part of Hod Dibbin uh, in the people writing about his uh, time in the Brotherhood of Satan. This black magic circle, he says he was in. Um, of course, and he's claiming he done he 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 became good again, and he lost, and he became good again. And this is obviously a lot of this is just ways to excuse all the man in the mask rumors and the satanic style parties that he was throwing. There were sex compromise operations and to draw people who like this sort of stuff because this stuff was popular at that time, especially horror movies. People don't realize that in the, you know, in the 50s and 60s and uh, 70s, you would um, go to like, these horror double bills at the cinema. So you go to the cinema and you'd watch two movies in a row uh, or three movies sometimes in a row and spend a whole day in the cinema uh, eating popcorn, messing about, um, being scared of horror movies. So like they used to do Hammer Horror double bills and stuff and you'd go and watch two movies. So horror was a new thing that was coming around and it quite captured the imagination because it was quite a trend and a fad and meant for adults. It meant that the other trend fad meant for adult could be classed as adult entertainment would be pornography and things like that so they merged quite well and the idea that there were satanic black magic circles running around and they were they were real and they were really worshiping the devil and all of this stuff was happening now all the embellishments on these stories are just that they're embellishments um what these most of the time were were a load of uh, weird adults who uh, were reading out of books and having sex with each other <laughs> and that attracted other weird adults who like to have sex or like to read books or like esoteric sort of like this, um, supposedly pseudo spiritual um, stuff psychobabble which most satanic stuff is just psychobabble, um, carefully worded sentences, and people going, oh, I, I'm going to worship this, and it's going to make this happen, which then, when things happen, they attribute those things to the the thing that they're doing to make things happen. Of course, that's what anybody would do, isn't it? It's what you would do, it's what I would do. Um, and the, uh, the opposing force, of course, is the church, and he acts like, oh, I'm in the church, and Satan, church and Satan, and they try and mix it all up. And a lot of this time, there's a lot of people doing lots of really evil stuff. So at the same time, it becomes like anything evil that comes out is suddenly, oh, well, maybe he's a Satanist. And then it becomes ridiculous. It becomes hot dibbing. And that's what hot dibbing was really good. That's why he, his sexual compromise operations worked really well, because he would make the uh, factual stuff look completely ridiculous by linking it with all of these different things like Satanist black magic circle. And this is part of the satanic panic. This was intelligence operations happening. Hod Dibbin had many links with intelligence operations. Mariella herself said later on that she worked for um, intelligence agencies. So understand what they're doing. And this is why we're going to look through it because now when you read that, it's ridiculous, of course, but you can see the bigger picture. He was this person. He was organizing these parties. He was trying to excuse behavior and attract people to this sort of like trend and fad and that's very interesting so i hope you enjoyed that and uh stay tuned there's two more to go and then um there may be some more but we'll talk about that another time for me johnny vedmore and you sound bye having a great reset for the post-corona era